All right, guys, now we'll look at benchmark four uh, for the non-renewable energy sources, nuclear and coal and those types of things, okay? So let's get going here so that we can better ourselves and reach our goal of graduating with a high school diploma. Non-renewable energy is non-renewable. It runs out. You know that. Uh, examples fossil fuel and nuclear all right black lung disease is a um, lung disease for coal miners they would get this disease from breathing in too much from working in the coal mines so it's just really black lung disease. You don't need to know a lot about it except it's a problem of working in coal mines. One of the negative aspects of it. Hydraulic fracturing is process of using water to break rock. And this is for getting natural gas. That's what we use that for, to get natural gas, okay? Uh, fracking fluid is a mixture of chemicals and water. And the reason we have that on there is because that's one of the negative problems is using that fracking fluid because it comes back out as pollution. Ash storage pond is uh, coal waste and water. And that's where we store it, in the ash storage pond. It's a storage container for the coal waste and water. All right, so let's look at these non-renewable resources here. Uh, circle the three non-renewable fossil fuels in the list of energy sources. So we got oil, natural gas, and coal. Of course, nuclear is a non-renewable, but it is not a fossil fuel. All right. So what organism organic matter gives rise to coal, plant matter, uh, same thing there for petroleum. We're not going to, you're not going to be asked that. Uh, I was actually thinking about removing those questions, but uh, identify four methods of coal mining. Okay, so one, we're going to pit, we're going to dig these big pits, we're going to strip mining, okay. Uh, we're going to mountaintop explosion or mountaintop removal. And then we have, uh, my brain is slipping on me, tunnel mining. It wasn't called tunneling, though. What did we, what was it called? Deep in the ground mining, tunneling, <laughs> drilling. I, was, wouldn't have, I mean, I guess you drill kind of to get started your tunnel. Uh, Subsurface, I think that's what it called, subsurface. A tunnel. All right, so subsurface or digging a tunnel into the ground. And so each of these have their problems, but one of the main problems is acid mine drainage. Okay, what substances are, re are released into water in acid mine drainage? Uh, acidic, coal, dust or a mixture of that coal dust from the water seeping through uh, releases out and remember it has that rust color uh, when it comes out so definitely harmful to the environment and the fish there explain why environmental damage could be caused by an oil spillage that's so much greater if something similar and that's a really simple answer there we don't need all these lines is because it's a liquid so it's hard to to recover, it's hard to, to uh, get out of the ground. So obviously if this liquid spills on the soil, it mixes into the soil. If it spills in the ocean, it spreads out. So the environmental damage caused by oil spill is much greater than others because simply the fact that it's a liquid, okay? What are two potential environmental side effects of hydraulic fracturing, okay? Uh, pollution of the waste water 
the water that we've put into the ground to frack the rock comes back out and becomes a part of pollution there. And the other potential is the, uh, I'm trying to think of the other problem we had there. We had the, yeah, yeah, I think so. It's the, uh, let's just put that, the unsteady ground. You know, as we fracture that rock, we create areas that are no longer have that good solid foundation, unsteady ground, or the ground could move there. Okay, that's not the exact terminology used, but I think you get the idea. All right, the residual ash produced by coal fire plants in short term and long term, what happens to the residual ash? Okay, uh, the short term and long term effects of that residual ash, coal fired power plants. I can't remember off the top of my head. Did y'all look that up? Somebody was working on this earlier. Okay, we'll have to come back to that one there in a few minutes. I think the long term is stored in, yeah, I think pretty sure it is the ash uh, storage pond. And then the short term is released in stacks that, where that pollution's coming out, okay? All right. Uh, give a common application of the product of each of these. We went over this several times, and I hope everybody is tuning in that. Coal, what's the common application of coal? To produce electricity. Common application of oil is for transportation. And the common application of natural gas is heating, okay, heating your home or so. So we're going to circle one of these choices here. The cleanest burning fossil fuel is natural gas. Cleaning, cleaning burning fossil fuel is natural gas. The cleanest burning is natural gas. The lowest reserved production ratio. Okay, so let me get this or excuse me, let me get this, greatest reserve to production ratio. The greatest reserve. So which one has the greatest reserves? Coal. The lowest reserves would be oil. And it's really close to natural gas. Now, some charts have it uh, lower than natural gas, but most have it fairly close. The greatest number of products and applications? Oil. Remember that little chart we showed of oil? We got all types of fuels, all types of products, plastic industry, all kind of stuff comes out of that oil. The highest uh, return on investment, okay, so this has to do with the cost of it. And uh, natural, let's see, oil, again, had the highest. And the lowest was coal. And most likely to spill during transport, oil again. So we got lots of these with oil, but that's partly because we got so many uses of oil and so much need for oil that it just kind of runs high on that. Uh, which fossil fuel has the most years of reserves? Coal. What percentage of energy comes from fossil fuels? I'd have to look this uh, chart up, but 80% comes from fossil fuels, okay? I'd have to go back and look at these uh, individual. You can go back and find those individual ones. Uh, make a claim about the sustainability of fossil fuels. Well, we looked at that data. We made our chart that went up like this, right? And we said that it, if we continue to use at current rate, the problem not, is not even so much that we're using it at the current rate, is that we keep increasing the rate that we keep using it at. If we keep using it at the current rate, the supply will run out. Okay. All right, so you only need to go back and look up the individual percentages for coal, oil, and natural gas. But as a combined, 80% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. Okay, so those three percentage you find should run up to 80. All right, let's look it on the back real quick. Some definitions here of a nucleus and isotope. We're not going to ask you those. Ionizing radiation, this is the dangerous form. 
Uh, some examples are gamma, x-rays, and there's uh, some ultraviolet light is doing that as so. Nuclear fission, so fission is the splitting of a nucleus. And nuclear fallout is after explosion, or let's just say radiation from the sky after explosion. So after some type of explosion, that radiation is launched into the sky and eventually it falls back out. So fallout meltdown is the destruction of nuclear core. And it will literally melt because it gets so hot it melts down, but the core itself melts, but it also causes a rapid expansion of, of gases which could blow it off. Half-life is the time, excuse me, time for half to decay, for radioactive to decay. All right, proton, neutron, and electron. The protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and the electrons are negative. What's the most common fuel for nuclear weapons? Uranium. I don't know if y'all remember 235, but there's another form, 238, but uranium-235 is the most common. All right, let's look at what's happening in this diagram here. So what do we see at letter A? We see a neutron crashing into an unstable nucleus. So neutron <coughs> hits <coughs> an unstable nucleus. And if it's already unstable, when we hit it with a neutron, it becomes even more unstable. Part B, it splits into two parts. And then part C, we have these little circles here, which are more neutrons released. So part C is extra released neutrons hit uh, more atoms and cause them to split, okay? So what is more dangerous, 100 rems of radiation exposure from an external source or 100 radiation from an internal source and internal? It's much more dangerous. So this is the same amount of radiation, but it's more, it's more much more dangerous if it's inside of you because of the soft tissue, like you know your stomach or your liver or anything like that, your lung, it's the soft tissue, and it can penetrate that tissue much easier. All right, quickly look at this diagram here. All right, and so the control rods. Uh, look at the diagram. Describe the purpose. The control rods slow the fission in the core. The fuel rods are producing the heat, and we use that heat, don't forget, we use that heat to boil water. That water becomes steam, turns a turbine, turns a generator. And of course, we got our cooling tower, cools water. Uh, so, so the process can repeat. Uh, why do nuclear reactors have three separate water loops instead of just a single one? Uh, to protect against radiation. So some power plants just have one loop of water, but a nuclear power has multiple loops to help protect against radiation. Uh, under normal circumstances, what is emitted by a nuclear power plant? Nothing. Energy is emitted by a nuclear power plant. Steam, no pollution. That's right, we want you to think about. Under normal conditions, there is no pollution released from a power plant. Uh, how is nuclear waste disposed of and why? Uh, we have it in storage tanks. Why? Half-life, right? 
because even though it's a waste, it's still taking time to emit that, emit that radiation. Uh, how much time does it take it for a radioactive sample? A radioactive sample to decay depends on half-life. Some have a short half-life, some have a longer half-life. Uh, okay. You'll have to look up the total energy generation from nuclear power. I think it's about 14%. I'm going to put a question mark, 14%. You have to look that up, okay? Go back and check that, okay? Check for accuracy on that. All right. Uh, make a claim about the sustainability of nuclear. Nuclear power is also non-renewable. So it itself will also run out. It is not sustainable due to the same effect we have earlier. The increased use of it is going to decrease the sustainability. Did you find something on that? Okay. So I think we're good there. So make a claim about the sustainability again. It is, it's a non-renewable resource. It is also not sustainable. Uh, how many years does it have? Again, I don't know off the top of my head because we really haven't tapped into nuclear quite as much because the amount of radiation we got out there, we got a little scared of it and we've stopped some of the production. But there are new power plants, one being built in Georgia actually. So, yeah. All right, so someone looked up this, and they got 19 or 20 percent, 19.7 or about 20 percent. Okay. All right. Yeah, make a claim about the sustainability. It's the same thing. It's, it's not... This has got the same problems that coal and fossil fuels have got. It's not sustainable for an extended period of time due to all the same issues that we got.